All right, everything seems to be functioning now. Uh, so yes, let's go ahead with our class. Uh, so we are going to be entering into the book of Deuteronomy today, uh, which is what we will be discussing. So in the Deuteronomy, you have a second presentation of the law. Uh, the word DEU is uh, basically your Latin word for second. And so it is a second presentation of the same law which was given at the Mount of Sinai. So you have a new generation of people uh, who have uh, uh, grown up in the wilderness, who are now going to be entering into the promised land. So before they enter in, the Lord wants to remind them of the covenant which he has made with uh, their uh, parents. And so uh, the law is presented a second time uh, over here. And um, the main thing that we see uh, in this book of Deuteronomy, for 177 times you have phrases like do, keep, observe. Those words are repeated 177 times in the book of Deuteronomy. It's as though the Lord is trying to um, urge these, this new generation to be doers of what he is saying. Because their parents refused to do what God wanted. You know, and they perished in the wilderness. So the Lord is saying, do not be like your the previous generation. Observe what the Lord has given to you. Uh, fulfill those covenant um, you know, conditions which have been laid down. So this is like a reminder to this new generation before they step in to make their conquest. I think it applies even to us today. You know, we have our own conquests. We may not really want to go and conquer um, uh, Canaan, but then we have our own battles which we would like to overcome, which we would like to succeed in. And the basic uh, requirement is that we first start off by keeping the Lord's instructions and his ways. When we do that, automatically we start preparing the ground for our victory. And so this generation, this new generation, um, is now learning to keep the law, observe the law, and preparing themselves for the victory which is going to come when they step into the promised land. Uh, so the book of Deuteronomy is almost like a summary of the first four books. Because here in Deuteronomy, Moses is again reminding them of all the main things uh, which the Lord has planned for them as a nation. Uh, so he, in fact, even... Um, gives a brief um, you know, uh, summary of their history, of how God has brought them this far and what he has done for them. So it's all, um, Deuteronomy is almost like a summary of the first four books. And um, the Jewish people regarded this book as the most authoritative among all the you know, um, first five books. Why did they regard it so authoritative? Because here you have a summary of the main important things which the Lord wants to convey to his people. And so, which is why, because they regarded it as so important, Jesus preferred to do most of his quotations from the book of Deuteronomy. We see that again and again, he refers to the book of Deuteronomy when he is making references. Um, because the Jews would be more familiar with this particular book. In fact, they say that the Sermon on the Mount, which Jesus gives in uh, you know, Matthew's cha Matthew chapters 5 to 7, that is probably based on the book of Deuteronomy. And um, um, uh, someone once asks Jesus, which uh, teacher do you think is the greatest commandment? And it's, it's again from Deuteronomy that the Lord replies. Um, you know, he's, he quotes Deuteronomy 6, 5, where it says, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, uh, and love your neighbor as yourself. So uh, it's always Deuteronomy which gets emphasized by Jesus. In fact, if you recollect, when Jesus was fair, faced with those temptations which Satan brings, all the three quotations which he uses in fighting back Satan, it is taken from the book of Deuteronomy. So Jesus was one example of a person who was doing the word, keeping the law, observing it, and he used it to fight Satan, to fight temptation. So the book of Deuteronomy has got this prominence. Um, let's um, look at the structure, the overall structure of this book. 
um, we could maybe divide it into four main sections. The first four chapters is where Moses um, reminds the people of their history all the way from Adam, what God did for them, how he has brought them this far. Uh, so the first four chapters is more um, um, a summary of their past history and their wanderings in the wilderness. And then uh, chapters 5 to 28 is where you have um, the Ten Commandments being repeated. Uh, you also have various instructions given uh, on how to live a godly life. There are laws given about worship, about uh, relationships, about divorce. There are all kinds of um, laws having to do with practical life given in this uh, in the second section. The third section could be chapters 29 and 30, uh, because in these chapters is where um, Moses formally renews the covenant with this new generation. They all come and stand in front of Yahweh in his presence. And the covenant is once again uh, read out loud. And the people make a commitment and say, yes, we will keep this covenant. So there's a renewal ceremony of the covenant done in chapters uh, 29 and 30. And then uh, the last section would be chapters 31 to 34. Uh, this is basically where we see um, Moses uh, formally uh, you know, um, instituting Joshua as the next leader. So Joshua comes into leadership. And then uh, we also see a brief account of the death of Moses being described over here. Um, so these things happen in the last few chapters. There are two songs which Moses uh, sings and teaches the people. That's also recorded over here in this uh, last section. So moving very quickly into the important concepts, the important highlights which we see in this book of Deuteronomy. Um, the very first thing to note about this book of Deuteronomy is that uh, the Lord inspired the writer to write this book in a particular way. The writer uses the same literary pattern which you find in the treaties and covenants of those ancient times. Um, uh, archaeologists have actually discovered uh, some um, Hittite treaties from those uh, times. And when they compare the pattern which is used in the Hittite treaties, and they look at the pattern which is there in the book of Deuteronomy, it's almost identical. So it's as though the Lord was saying, you know what, this is not just me talking to you. I am making a formal treaty with you. You're familiar with the way treaties are done um, among your uh, peoples, right? Um, you know, the way the Hittites do it, the way the other uh, neighboring nations do it. And the Lord is saying, in the same way, I am making a similar treaty with all of you, and you must keep it. So if we look at this pattern which is there. We look at the similarity that is there between the Hittite treaties and the book of Deuteronomy. Um, so usually the Hittite treaty would begin with an introduction, a preamble. And uh, so when you come to Deuteronomy, the introduction would be, you know, Yahweh speaking, which would be Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. So we could say that this, these first five verses are like the preamble, the introduction to the treaty which God is making with his people. In a Hittite treaty, the next um, uh, section would basically be where the king talks about his greatness, his exploits, all the victories which he has won. Uh, so that would be generally the second section of a Hittite treaty. And we see the same thing in Deuteronomy. So in Deuteronomy chapter 1, from verse 6 onwards, all the way up to chapter 4, uh, verse 49, you have um, the acts of God on behalf of the people mentioned all the things that God did for them, the victories which they were able to win, you know, by his power. So all this is recorded in the second uh, section. In a Hittite treaty, the third section will be the main section where it talks about the treaty conditions. Um, so here in Deuteronomy, we have something similar. 
so in deuteronomy chapters 5 up to chapter 26 is where you have all the details of the treaty um uh, deuteronomy chapters 5 to 11 is where, where you have some general terms and conditions given and then once you move into chapters 12 to 26 you have some very very specific uh, you know um, uh, terms and conditions being outlined so later you know when you um, um, after after we finish our class and you have time go through the book of deuteronomy and look at these sections and see uh, how uh, you know um, uh, how it would have looked as a treaty document so um, chapters 5 to 26 are the treaty terms and conditions and then in a hittite treaty the next main section would basically be the um, the obligations of either party you know of, of both the parties uh, so in a hittite treaty the hittites were quite a successful uh, you know royal um, uh, you know um, um, household so uh, they were generally the superior king and they would make a treaty with one of the vassals that's the um, historical term that is used v a s s a l a vassal is basically a king who is of a inferior position a lower nation not very victorious not very successful and now this this hittite king is um offering this vassal the privilege of having a treaty with someone like him you know so um so in the treaty he would say i will fulfill these conditions when another enemy comes and attacks you i will come and protect you i will help you but you from your side these are the rules and conditions which you would have to fulfill if you want to remain in this partnership so the superior hittite king is offering conditions which the uh, lower inferior vassal would need to follow so that he can enjoy the benefit and protection of this superior king whenever any enemy attacks so an advantage of this for the uh, for the for the lesser king is that uh, other strong nations will think twice before coming and attacking them because they know that this man now has got the backing of the Hittites. So they will hesitate to come and attack this nation. So it was actually advantageous to the vassals to enter into such a treaty. So here, if you look at Deuteronomy, Yahweh, the king of kings and lord of lords, I mean, who's far superior to the Hittite kings and any other king or any other authority, he is saying, I am willing to enter into a treaty with you human people, you tiny little nation of Israel. I am willing to enter into a treaty with you, but these are going to be the conditions which you will have to keep. If you keep these conditions, you will have great victory. One soldier can chase a thousand enemy soldiers. You will have great success. So in this uh, next section, the fourth section, that would be Deuteronomy chapters 27 to 29. You have a list of the benefits and you have a list of the consequences if they break the terms of this treaty. Just like in the Hittite treaties, you know, because the king would warn and say, in case you are disloyal to me, in case you go and make um, partnerships with my enemies, then these will be the consequences which would come upon your head. So in the same way here in Deuteronomy, the Lord also lists out the benefits and the consequences. You know, most of us are really familiar with this portion. Deuteronomy 28 is basically where you have the list of all the blessings. And Deuteronomy 29 is where you would have the, uh, no, Deuteronomy 27 is where you would have the list of the consequences. You have a question? I thought you put up your hand. <laughs> okay. Um, so coming to the fifth portion, the last portion of a Hittite treaty, that is basically where you have the witnesses, you know, signing off on the treaty. So what kind of a witness did they consider back in those days? They would take a copy of that treaty and they would place it in their Hittite temple. You know, as though they are saying that their um, idol, their uh, pagan god is witnessing this treaty which has taken place between the two kings. Uh, so that would be the witness. 
what about the biblical parallel of this uh, we see a biblical parallel because the 10 commandments are placed in the ark of the covenant so in the same way the hittites would place their treaty in front of their idol so that so that the idol is like a witness between uh, about the, uh, for the agreement between the two parties here also biblically we see uh, the 10 commandments being placed in the ark in the presence of the lord as a witness that these people have been given these conditions and now it is upon them whether they choose to fulfill these conditions or not. Uh, another thing that was done as part of the witness um, process is that one copy would be given to the vassal king. So he needs to hold on to the copy, make sure that he's fulfilling all the requirements which are there in that. So maybe once in a while he needs to open that look at it and make sure that he is meeting all those conditions. Were the Israelites given a copy, a similar copy? Um, we see that happening uh, when we look at two verses which talk about the witness part of it. Um, so Exodus chapter 25 verse 16 is where the Lord says, you know, uh, you must put in the ark the tablets of the covenant law. We've talked about that. The second thing which the Lord says is in Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, where it says, um, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. So the Lord is saying, I'm going to make the heavens and the earth itself as witnesses. They are going to watch you and um, decide whether you are keeping my laws and you know earning the blessings or whether you are breaking my laws and bringing the consequences upon your head. So the Lord says, I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you. So the heavens and the earth themselves will witness and tell whether you are keeping my ways or not. And then coming to the copy which is supposed to be given to the Israelites, you know, in um, in parallel to the way the Hittites did it, uh, we see that in Deuteronomy 31 verse 19. I hope that you have your Bibles with you. I hope you have been looking at the book of Deuteronomy even as we've been talking about all this. So if we can have one person read out for us Deuteronomy 31 19, where the Lord says something specific. Uh, so if someone could read out that for us, Deuteronomy 31, verse 19. Okay. Write down this song for yourself and teach it to the children of Israel, put it in their mouths, that these songs may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Exactly. So the Lord um, inspires Moses to compose two songs. So why why did the lord uh, use songs because in those days poetry and songs were easy to memorize because they have a you know um they have some key uh, matching ideas it becomes easier to memorize things we know which have matching thoughts uh, from line to line uh, so it's a kind of uh, rhythm so the lord asks moses to teach the people these two songs Maybe it's maybe you can call it one song with two parts. Yeah. So the Lord asks Moses to to teach the song to the people so that that will be their copy. So they and their children uh, would would learn this song, sing it, and remind themselves of what the Lord requires. So that is basically what you find in um, chapter thirty two and chapter thirty three. Chapter thirty two is generally called the Song of Moses. And chapter 33 is basically called the blessing of Moses because that's uh, that's where uh, he outlines the blessings which the Lord is speaking over each tribe. Uh, so uh, if we can have someone read out for us Deuteronomy 32 verses 44 to 47. This is what the Lord, um, yeah, this is what it, it records over there. Deuteronomy 32 verses 44 to 47, please. Moses came with Joshua, the son of Nun, spoke all words of this song in hearing of the people. Moses finished uh, speaking all these words to all Israel, and he said to them, 
that your heart is on all the works which are necessary and only good in, which you shall command your children to be careful to observe all the works of this heart, for it is not a cotton thing for you, because it is your life. By this word you shall prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Yoda to possess. So here, uh, Moses along with Joshua, they go and speak the words of this song or maybe sing the words of this song to the people and the people uh, uh, record the words. So, um, you know, they're, they're going to be learning this, this song by heart. And then Moses says, please obey whatever is there in this. You know, let it be a reminder to you because there's a very important reason why they should, they should really memorize this and keep it in their minds because he says in verses 40 in verse 47 they are not just idle words for you they are your life i mean this this is such a powerful statement all these um, laws 613 laws which were given to the people you know which you find recorded in leviticus in numbers they are not just idle words they are literally the life of the people if the people keep these words their life will be blessed. If they do not keep these words, their life will be destroyed. So these are not just idle words. They are literally their life. And we can see the very same thing even about you know, our New Testament scriptures. These are not just words just to make us feel good once in a while. These words are literally our life. They can make or break our life depending on whether we keep them or whether we ignore them. Uh, and so he says to them, they are not just idle words for you. They are your life. By them you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Uh, so with those words, you know, he um, encourages them. And uh, this is another thing which uh, the Lord asks Moses to convey to the people, an instruction which is connected to what we were talking about uh, so far. Uh, so maybe you, you could read out that as well. Um, Deuteronomy 27 verses 9 to 13. Deuteronomy 27 verses 9 to 13, if someone could read out. When Moses and the priest, the Levitus spoke to all Israel, saying, Take hand and listen, O Israel, this day you have become the people of God. Your God, therefore, you shall obey the voice of the Lord your God and observe his commandments and his statute. Go ahead, continue. Which I command you today. And the Moses commanded the people on the same day, saying, This shall stand on the Mount Gerizim, the blessed the people who you have crossed over the Jodah, the Timian, Levi, Judah, Iskar. Uh, Joseph and Benjamin, and they shall stand on the Mount Ebal to curse Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. This is the instruction which is being given over here. Uh, Moses says to the people, You know, I'm asking you to do something because now you have become the people of the Lord your God. You guys have entered into a formal, official treaty with the Almighty God, with Yahweh. So now, there's something that I want you people to do. Once you enter into the promised land, after you have entered, after you have crossed the Jordan and entered into the land, this is what you are supposed to do. There are two mountains. You know, they have not yet entered the land, uh, but this is what Moses is telling them. Once you enter the land, there are going to be two mountains over there. One will be called Mount Gerizim and the other is Mount Ebal. You are supposed to go to these two mountains and I want six tribes to stand on one mountain and I want the other six tribes to stand on the other mountain and you will loudly call out the blessings and the curses. So the tribes which are standing on Mount Gerizim will loudly call out all the list of blessings which the Lord has given in Deuteronomy 28 and then uh, the, those who are standing on Mount Ebal, you know, they will call out the list of uh, curses which has which were given in Deuteronomy 27. So they would loudly proclaim this, and the um, uniqueness of this is that uh, even even today we have Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. You know, they're still there. The mountains are still there, 
and tourists generally go there and what they say is that when you if you go climb all the way up to the top of these mountains you can still hear the um, you know, there are some schools they say at the base of the mountain and if you go to the top of the mountain you can still hear the children laughing and you know playing down down below at, at the base of the mountain so the you know the acoustics over there is like really good um, people down below can hear what is being said on the mountain so you can imagine when they actually go into the land and they stand on these two mountains and declare and who is witnessing what they are declaring the heavens and the earth are the witnesses which are listening to what is being said the list of curses is being proclaimed the list of blessings is being put proclaimed and the people then say yes we will keep the covenant which the, we have made with the lord and the heavens and the earth witness are a witness to what they are uh, what they declare when they stand on these two mountains and do that at this point in deuteronomy it's still a future event which has not yet taken place but then it happens in the time of the book of joshua so moving on from there into this song of moses uh, which is in your in your deuteronomy chapter 32 uh, deuteronomy 33 is just a list of the blessings which are there upon each tribe but deuteronomy 32 is such a beautiful song in fact in the very end times you know when uh, the people in the book of revelation are undergoing a lot of severe persecution at that time they actually sing the song of moses so this is something very very uh, precious and valuable let's just very briefly you know look through some of the highlights which are there in this particular song of moses in deuteronomy chapter 32 so in deuteronomy 32 if you were to you know look at verses 10 to 12 these verses always tug at my heart whenever i read them it's so beautiful what the lord says uh, you know uh, what the lord is singing through moses in these uh, verses uh, moses reminds the people of the love which has been showered upon them uh, upon the people by god he says um, uh, in a desert land he found him you know the lord found israel when israel was nothing nobody israel was just a slave unimportant unvalued only useful for whipping and beating and getting the work done he had no value no worth when he was in that condition it says when he was in this desert land the lord found him and then it says he shielded him and cared for him he guarded him as the apple of his eye and then it says like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young that spreads its wings uh, to catch them and carries them aloft so here it's talking about how the eagle watches over its young tends to them cares for them starts helping them to develop and grow and then when these little birds are old enough to try out their wings then the uh, mother bird starts stirring up the nest so that they can't continue sitting over there you know and waste their lives so it's it begins to pull out the uh, the pull apart the nests so that the birds can't just stay there inside anymore now they have to step out and learn to fly so the lord tried to train these people of israel in the same way tried to make them strong enough and then wanted to push them into the promise promised land where they can try out their wings and learn how to fly learn how to gain victory you know so um, and then it says something uh, beautiful about the eagle it says the eagle spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft uh, so this is imagery which is used where the eagle stirs up the nest pushes the birds out forces them to learn to fly and in the beginning when they are trying to fly they may not be really very good at it you know they may start um, plummeting to the earth below and when that happens the mother bird quickly goes to them and tries to support them tries to help them so that they don't come all the way down to the ground and hit the ground rather you know it kind of supports the bird the, the baby bird so that it's able to learn how to use its wings um so it talks of uh, uh, the same imagery is used even in exodus 194 where the lord says 
uh, you yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. So uh, this is imagery of the Lord teaching his um, teaching his young children how to fight, how to gain victories, how to be um, uh, how to be uh, faithful and strong and courageous. This is the Father God teaching his yeah, this youngster whom he found in the desert and adopted as his own child is now teaching him, training him to become a warrior, to become a victorious person. So this is imagery which we can you know apply even to ourselves. The Lord just doesn't leave us in the nest to sit over there and get fat and get useless. He starts at some point. He starts pushing us out of the nest. He starts allowing trials to come into our lives because he needs to teach us to learn to assert our faith, to stand on his word and start gaining victory. So the Lord starts doing that. But it's good to remember that he's always there with his wings spread out, ready to support, ready to help. He will not allow us to crash to the ground and be destroyed. So we can be encouraged that the Lord is guarding us like the apple of his eye. I mean, uh, when I was a kid, I never understood what on earth an apple of the eye is. You definitely don't get that in the market. An apple of the eye is basically the that you know the black iris which is there in your eye. That is basically called the apple of the eye. How carefully do you guard that? Imagine if I were to bring my finger even slightly closer to your eye, immediately you would shut your eye because you really guard the apple of your eye so that nothing ever touches it. And the Lord says over here, that's the way I have chosen to love you, guard you, watch over you. So yes, I will push you out of the nest. Yes, you will be facing enemies. But in the process, you will learn to fly. Those who wait upon the Lord, you know, they will rise up on wings of eagles. So you will learn. You In the beginning, you may flap around like a little baby bird. But by and by... As, you, as your faith go, grows stronger, you will learn to fly and you will learn to soar above the storm clouds is what the Lord you know, is telling his people over here. But what is the response of this Israel in 32.15 is where you have those very sad words. It talks about uh, Israel as Jeshurun and it says, Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. I mean, he Jeshurun chooses to kick the Lord who you know, blessed him. So he grows fat, he grows proud, and he grows lazy. And it says that he kicks out at the one who has blessed him. And it says, they abandoned the God who made them and rejected the rock, their savior. And so then it goes on to talk about the, you know, the um, punishment which God brings upon them. That would be in verses 28 to 30. And it says, how even one Israelite, um, you know, um, yeah, that would be in verse 20, verse 30. How could one man chase a thousand or two put 10,000 to flight? So one enemy is able to chase off a thousand Israelites. I mean, they are, they're in such a bad position that one, one enemy can easily wipe out a thousand. And in the same way, it says two can put 10,000 to flight. They were reduced to that position because their rock had sold them. The Lord finally sold them into slavery because they were not grateful for what he did for them out in the wilderness. So maybe it's a lesson that we can learn. You know, we've all been, uh, nobody was, no baby was born a full, full scale believer. I mean, we all have a wilderness behind us in our past where we did not know the Lord, where Satan could do anything to us and our families. We had no protection. When we were in that condition, the Lord took us under his wing. He cared for us. He nurtured us. He helped us to develop and grow. So let us not be like this Jeshurun who kicked out, who grew fat and kicked out at the God who had uh, cared for him. Rather, let us be people who are faithful to him. And in spite of the punishment which the Lord brings upon his people, this is what he says in uh, uh, verse 30, uh, chapter 32, verse 43. He says, Rejoice, you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. Even though he uses enemies to punish them, 
a day will come when he will ta take vengeance even on those enemies he will not let those enemies just go free after what they did to his people so yes when correction was needed the lord corrected his people but he did it out of love and so later even those enemies were punished for what they did to his people so this song reveals the heart of yahweh the kind of god that we worship you know so this should be an encouragement to us to follow him and honor him in all that we do um to move into another concept it's very sad we lost a lot of time almost 15 minutes on the audio uh, but then yeah let's see what we can squeeze in uh, into this last 5 minutes uh when you look at deuteronomy chapter 5 you see a repetition of the 10 commandments so um what should we follow we should we follow the 10 commandments in exodus 20 or do we follow the 10 commandments which are given in deuteronomy 5 if you were to compare these two uh, you know um versions you see that they are almost identical there's only one main difference between the 10 commandments as they are recorded in 20 in exodus 20 and here in deuteronomy 5 the one main difference is regarding the command about the sabbath day this that's the only difference in exodus 20 uh, verses 8 to 11 we are told that the israelites should keep the sabbath because it says in verse 11 exodus 20 verse 11 it says for in 6 days the lord made the heavens and the earth uh, and it says that he rested on the 7th day it says that the lord blessed the sabbath day and made it holy so because the lord sanctified and set apart the seventh day therefore the people must observe the sabbath that is what we are told in exodus 20 but then when we come over here to deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 12 to 15 there's a second reason given to the people about why they should keep the sabbath in deuteronomy 5 we are told so that your male and female servants may rest as you do remember that you were slaves in egypt and that the lord your god brought you out of there with a mighty hand so the people are told yes you must observe the sabbath as holy uh, in remembrance of the creation which i made in remembrance of everything that i provided for you in creation so trust in me rest in me on the seventh day but also remember another thing you went out of that rest and into slavery you chose to to follow idols and become the slaves of the egyptians but in spite of what you did to yourselves i delivered you with a mighty hand and brought you out so be grateful for that remember what i did for you and now that you are established in the promised land and you have your own servants and slaves remember the days when you were a slave and treat them differently don't treat them the way you were treated back in egypt and so the lord says you must keep the sabbath for two reasons first to remember to remind yourselves of all that the lord has provided for you in creation imagine the entire creation i mean we don't have time to get into these scriptures uh, but you know if you were to look in the genesis uh, ch genesis chapter 1 last verse and then the first two or three verses of chapter 2 it talks about the vast array of creation which the lord created and then it says that he rested from his works so this entire vast array of creation was made for humans all this was made the planets and the stars and and all the you know the physics and the chemistry it is all just for humans god did it good did everything for humans so he says on the seventh day don't rush around desperately working just rest relax chill remember who i am what i have done for you and know that you are precious know that you are valuable i made everything for you so on the seventh day just rest in me and now in in deuteronomy we are also told remind yourselves of what i did you left my rest you went into sin you you brought slavery upon your heads but even then i brought you out and rescued you that is who i am 
So because of the mercy and love shown to you, now please show the same mercy and love towards your servants and slaves. Let them also enjoy their seventh day of rest. Do not make them work on that day. Okay, so that was a very brief version of what I actually wanted to talk about. Um, so yeah, we will um, close with a word of prayer simply because we are out of time. All right, yeah, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much that your scriptures reveal to us so clearly your heart, who you are. And we can genuinely be safe and secure in you. So we pray, O oh Lord, that we would remember and relish this, that you guard us like the apple of your eye, that we are that important to you. And we pray that we would show the same grace and mercy which you have shown us. We pray that we would show it to the people who are maybe below us, who are depending on us. So we pray, O oh Lord, that we would not only uh, value what you have done for us, but that we would also use that uh, to bless others who may come to us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.